You're the shepherd of my soul. Amen. Hallelujah. Man. Well, I've been praying. I told uh, Tyler and Teresa yesterday, I said, I believe today is the day of miracles. And uh, whew, I'm going to try to get through this. <laughs> no, good. Go ahead and open your Bibles with me to uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 13. And uh, praise God. So let me just tell you what's been going on in our house. <laughs> I know she was saying the other day, she was like, man, you just, you know, I, my turns have been coming and going. I haven't been able to get up here and, and uh, take my turns delivering the message. And uh, in all of that time, of course, you know, I'm still studying, receiving stuff from God and preparing for the New Year's Eve service, which, uh, you know, is our projection, right, our outlook for the year 2024. <laughs> and if you just want a little hint of uh, what the way that God's been leading me, it's, it's the study. I haven't been able to get past this, this greater still and, and the miracles. Uh, and so you all know what's going on in our household, right? We've been fighting his condition for how many years now? 13 years, right? So as we, this week, a couple of discussions actually kind of, you know, transformed my message into what it is today. And for those of you that, that don't know her, if we haven't said, we keep praying for my mother-in-law because my mother-in-law was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And everybody doesn't want to say that because we don't want to, we will never give the position to cancer, correct, right? Which is why all of my praises, all of my songs deal with Everything that God said is greater. His name is greater. And that's why the blood is so important is because even if you don't know what to say, all you got to do is plead the blood. The blood of Jesus is greater than any disease, condition, or name that is named. And so when we just plead the blood, when you don't know what else to say, just plead the blood. Because the blood is a, it's a better word. Think of a better word if you can. And that's why, I like, you know, the, the English language is so limited in how you can describe and praise God, which is why the ability that he gave us to speak in another language in tongues, our own personal language to him, generates and creates the power that it creates is because it's so far beyond the, the English language. We're praying not only for things that we, you know, can, can understand and comprehend in our mind, but we're praying beyond those things, reaching out into that wheel that, I'm, that I always tell you about, the spokes that are on that wheel. You're touching points in time just by praying in the Spirit. You're praying things that you don't know and understand the implications of, right? You're being used by the Spirit of God when you pray in that language. That's why... Anybody that would say that that gift is not for today, I would question, why would that not be for today? Why would it, why would it ever lose its uh, relevance? It would never lose its relevance. To be able to affect, right, isn't that what the entire world is wanting to know the future? What's the future? We don't know the future, but we know that we can influence what happens by prayer. So, this message comes from a couple of discussions that were uh, one with my boss and, and one with my wife. And for everybody that doesn't know why Holly has not been able to come on Sunday mornings, her mama is doing her treatments on Fridays every other week. And her sister comes into town and then when she leaves, usually on Sunday morning, the steroid that they give her when she does her treatments is wearing off. And the treatments have been very difficult for Sissy, that's who we call Sissy. So, <clears throat> but I'll be honest with you, they're even as difficult or even more so difficult on my wife. And as her husband, this message, all of you are going to be able to relate to this message today because, I mean, I look at my mother and I think, for 13 years now, she's been fighting this battle with him, beside him, 
but she's got her own personal battle that she's been fighting in order to deal with what he's dealing with. Okay? And <laughs> believe me, pillar of strength right here. I, I can tell you pillar of strength. But I know that in her private moments, she struggles just as each and every one of us would to be able to regroup and reface the next day. And that's exactly what my wife is going through. And that's what I'm going through <laughs> with her is to be able to support her while she supports her mother so sissy's got a faith fight of her own holly has a faith fight with her and all of us fighting together as a body through corporate prayer right we're all praying for one another and yet each of us individually has our own personal battles going on within that okay and so Late night porch discussion, and I've had this discussion with my sister and actually with mama. We've all been having these discussions lately. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I've, I've actually preached this message somewhat before, but this time it's got a little bit more depth to it, where dealing with doubt, is it okay to question God, right? And I've... I've always said yes. I mean, how many of you just <laughs> by a show of hands, right? I'm not going to be the only one in the room to be able to say this, but I've had my screaming fits at the enemy, right? I'll scream, rant, rave, and cuss at the devil, and then turn around and look at God and say, why are we going through this, and where are you at? And so this, is, this message came from that. So I said, is it okay to question God? Why are we letting or why are you letting or why is this happening that's a common question that everybody wants to know right we we say like cancer why are you fighting cancer like you've done nothing in your body if you say this to yourself I've done nothing to warrant me getting cancer like I didn't smoke I didn't drink I didn't do all those other things I don't eat all the stuff that they tell you not to eat but yet, you got cancer anyway. Or whatever your ailment may be. Whatever, is, whatever you're fighting, whatever you're facing. Why am I fighting this? Why am I facing this? I'm a good person. I'm born again. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Then my, then my favorite one is, all right, well, we've established why it's happening. When are things going to change? How long is this going to take, right? We're not a very patient people. So when God tells us to have patience right, so that he can do his perfect work, well, we all want the time frame on that. How long is it going to take, right? Did I think this would take 13 years? No. Am I going to give up because it's taken 13 years? No. Is he going to quit because it's taken 13 years? What if it takes another 13? And you'll see where I'm going with this here in just a minute. When are things going to change and when are they going to get better? Don't you care, God? Don't you care that we're going through this? Listen, I'm going to tell you right now. I would much rather me be going through the pain and the suffering than watching someone else go through the pain and suffering. And so you're like, I mean, I forget which song it was. There was a song years ago that uh, uh, Tim McGraw did, and he was like, you know, don't take the girl take me instead like I would say put myself in that position let let me bear the pain for her but God reminded me I bore the pain I took the pain at the cross and yet your loved one that you're watching suffer is still suffering in pain and you're like okay so you come to the real you come to the reality and the realization that you're a part of the fight but that's all you are you're a part of it you can't I can't will or faith my mother-in-law healed. I can't. It's not my faith that makes her whole. It's her faith. And it's how much fight does she have in her. What does she want to see, right? Praise God, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> and then, how are you okay with all this pain and suffering, God? Like, this is not okay. You said that you bore our pain. You bore our sin, our sickness, and our disease. You said that. So going through this process, you got to understand, like, this, all this is okay to say to him. And there comes a point, which I'm going to show you here in just a second. Second, God, don't you, ever, don't you even hear me? Are you listening? Are you, 
Now, you think, like I think this all the time. The world is ginormous. The amount of believers and actually even non-believers that, right, when a non-believer has gotten to the point where there's nothing else they can do, they call on God, right, which praise God, thank God they do, because somebody in their life has told them about God, right? And so at least when they get to that, that Hail Mary point, they're, help me God, help me. And, you know, everybody wants to know, don't you hear me? Can't you hear me? But this one right here, this one is where things can turn south and go the other direction. Are you even real? Are you up there? Do you even hear me? Are you even real? When you begin to question God's reality, then that's when it can turn to be sinful. People, Because I can honestly say, growing up, I never really heard whether it was okay to, to you know, question God or not, but getting the general consensus from the church that it wasn't okay, that whatever God said is the way it goes, and God is sovereign, and He's not to be questioned, and yada, yada, yada. Well, then they become pastors, and he becomes, uh, in, in a quest, a search for knowledge, so much so that he gets a theology degree, right? Because we want to know who is God. Who is this person, this deity that we have given over our entire lives to based on the trust and the faith that when this is all said and done, there is an afterlife. There's somewhere to go. That we have the promise of heaven. Our name is written down in some fictitious book. Right? So it's a quest for knowledge. These, these questions that we're asking are for us to gain knowledge. And what would it benefit God to not answer those questions? Right? Right? God's word tells us to draw nigh, right? If you want to know, he says, come knock on the door. Is he not going to answer? Is he going to let you stand out there in the rain and the cold and knock on the door and just wonder if he's real? He's going to show himself real. But you're going to see a couple of things here. In the book of Numbers, I told you to go there, uh, flip over to chapter 13. And you're all going to know this story, right? So second discussion this week was... My boss was asking how my mother-in-law was doing, and I, I told her she's, she's struggling. I mean, it's just the reality. She's, she's struggling with everything that's going on, right? And then we have two problems now. So all the medication that they pump you with when you have cancer, and hers is a very serious cancer. We did get a, a great praise report this week. She got her numbers back, and the tumor decreased by 10%, which is fantastic. Because what that's done is that has uh, lowered her pain threshold, right? And so the, 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 but the medication that she takes is, is challenging at best, right? And everybody's like, well, if she's a believer, why is she taking medication? Come on now. So <laughs> everybody has to walk their own walk and fight their own fight, right? And, and I say, I've always said this, right? God is the God of healing and God has given every one of us, no matter what you've ever created or what you're, how smart you are in your mind, all of that information comes from God. So medical field professionals have gotten all of the information on all the medications as to how to fix and treat all these problems and ailments in our bodies over the years with the knowledge that comes from God, right? God is the creator. So if something was created to help us and assist us, God is the creator. Devil didn't create anything. Okay, so but if we if we agree to participate and partake of these things, then we have to deal with the side effects and the consequences, right? So my struggle has been like when you're fighting all these things that are messing with you mentally, they're messing with your mind, and so you're not as strong mentally, and everybody's like, well, you know what the Bible says, in, you, in your weakness, his strength is made. Yeah, that's true, that's what we're believing, but when you're... You have to put yourself in that position and say, mentally, I'm not strong enough to even say that. Matter of fact, I wonder if she can even think of that stuff right now because of all the stuff that's going on in her body. So not only is she fighting the medication, she's fighting the disease, she's fighting her own questions and doubts, just as many of you in here are. I mean, I couldn't help this week but think of <clears throat> David when I saw his pictures, and I think of all the other people in here that have been dealing with conditions and Vicky, Miss Vicky, I mean, one of the strongest faith people I know, right? I'm like, man, I tell Vicky, I say, throw that walker away, but that would be foolish, right? 
because she's going through her own struggle. And so I look around at the body and I'm thinking, all of us are going through these struggles and I'm just making sure that you know that it's okay to question God. And it's okay to get to the bottom and the root of what's causing the separation, right? Is it, is it a lack of faith? Is it a lack of trust? Is it something mental that's going on? Whatever it may be, there is a reason for it. And so in my discussion with my boss, as he was asking me how she was doing, I told him, you know, she's struggling. And uh, he told me a, a story of his family. Like his daughter, she was born with, I think it was, I I'm, hope I don't misquote this. I hope he's not watching today. But it was either cerebral palsy or, or muscular dystrophy. Anyway, she's confined to a wheelchair, right? And they knew that before she was born. And the doctors, of course, told her she's going to be born in, with this condition. We would recommend that you abort the child. And they didn't do that because he's a believer. And he said, no, if this is the path that God's got for us, then this is the path we're going to walk out. And she's been, I think she's 30 years old now, right? So he's been walking this out. And he said, would life have been much easier had we done that? Yes, it would have. But we would have missed out on so many things. And here's where the discussion really got to the nitty-gritty, because I said, immediately rose up in my memory, the Israelites. When Moses led them out of Egypt, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, okay? Now here they are, they've seen miracles that you and I may never see, right? With an ocean parted and not just walk across on soggy ground, but walk across on dry ground, right? To be fed basically from the sky, to be shaded in the daytime and, and heated and, and warm in the evening. All the things that you and I take for granted, they saw. So look at this. Chapter 13, verse 1. Numbers. The Lord said to Moses, Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land that I'm giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the twelve tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded. Verse 17, Moses gave these men instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north into the hill country and see what the land is like. Now drop down to verse 25. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses and Aaron and the whole community. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and shown them the fruit that they had taken from the land. <laughs> And I stopped right there and I thought, now that's a miracle in itself that the fruit survived 40 days of travel and it came back and it was pretty enough for them to go, wow, we've never seen a banana like that, right? Because I know in my house, if you put a banana out for like five days, it starts turning brown. So I can't imagine it was 40 days. So that alone in, in itself is a miracle. This was reported to Moses we entered the land that you sent us to explore, and it is indeed bountiful, a land flowing with milk and honey. And here's the kind of fruit that it produces. But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. Now, keep in mind, these cats have been walking with them out of Egypt. So they've seen all the miracles. And I just got to tell you, you know how like when something good goes and or you experience a miracle and, and you're just cruising right along and you're testifying about it and telling everybody about it, and you're just on that high, man. It's like, man, God is so good. God is so good. I can't imagine that those guys would come off of this type of experience with God and look at anything as a challenge as something that they couldn't overcome, or even better, they wouldn't even have to touch it because God would. God would destroy those people just on the sheer action of their belief. If they had said to Moses right here, man, we saw huge people, huge people. These guys are huge. Won't it be fun to watch God destroy them to give us this land? What would happen if they'd have said that? Look over at chapter 14 now. The whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night just because of this report. Oh, oh. How many times have we said to ourselves, God, we had it so much better in Egypt. Why did you bring us out here? Why would you bring us all this way to kill us and leave us for dead? 
and show us all this beautiful fruit that we could have, but here we are. There's this whole gap between where we are and where we see the good fruit that God is showing us. There's a big gap there, right? How do we get across that gap? <laughs> they, said, they said, if only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Where did God ever tell them that they had to fight for it? He didn't. He just told them to go. He said, go and take the land that I've given you. Period. That's all he said. <laughs> and you got to love Moses, right? I feel like Moses and I have a lot in common because Moses is like, man, shut up, shut up, shut up. You know God can hear you. Aaron's doing the same thing. Aaron at this point has already fallen on his face crying. Oh, God. What are these people doing to us? Tell them to shut up. They won't stop talking. And Moses has got their back. Moses is like, uh, look down at verse uh, 10. But the whole community began, we're in 1410. But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to the Israelites at the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me? Even after all the miraculous signs I have done among them, I will disown them and destroy them with a plague. Then I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they are. But Moses said, wait, 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 God. Wait. Hang on. Hang on. My name's on the line here too, right? I'm the one that convinced them to do this. I'm the one that, that you put in charge. So what about this? He said, what are the Egyptians going to think when they hear about it? That you done killed off your people, that you promised the promised land. That's not going to look good for you, God, right? So, remember what I asked you before, is it okay to question God? Look at Moses is questioning God. Moses is having a discussion with God to reach an end, right? To get smarter, to, to come to an agreement that's going to work for both parties, right? And to ultimately get them to the promised land. The, the fun part about the whole story, right, is the fact that God comes to an agreement and a compromise, and He says, yes, the future generations shall see the promised land, but this generation that would not believe me will never set foot in the promised land. Okay? But He made a plan for them. He made a provision for them. So in part of my, disco in part of my uh, discovery this week, uh, in study and preparation for this, let me read this for, uh, from one of the articles that uh, I thought was very pertinent for this discussion. So it says here that God had promised them victory. The land that he commanded them to go in and take it was already theirs. They simply had to trust and obey. But they did not do that. This is what I thought was very, very, very crucial. God will never lead us where His grace cannot provide for us. Nor where His power cannot protect us. God will never send you somewhere where you're unprotected, right? So even, even with this agreement and arrangement that He got into with Moses here, He still didn't leave them unprotected. He still protected them. He still provided for them. He just told them. Because of your lack of trust, you, this generation, will never see this promised land. But you second and third and fourth generations, those have been those are you that are now set to wander the wilderness on account of the lack of belief of your elders, what will you do? The choice is in your hands now. Indeed, the Israelites had seen the powerful hand of God at work during the plagues and the miracles of Exodus, yet like many people, they walked by sight and not by faith. And their unbelief displeased God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Their failure to believe in God's word kept them from entering the promised land. This is the other statement that I found that I really hit, that really hit home with me. This truth has never changed, right? 
The failure to believe in God's word will keep you from entering your promised land. That truth has never changed. Now, what the beautiful thing is, that has changed. Do you want to know what has changed? Jesus stepped on the scene. So, now you don't have to fear retribution from God Almighty, right? That he's going to strike you dead with a plague. Or he's going to be mad at you and keep you from the promised land. Because Jesus did what you and I, flesh, mankind, was not able to do. Which was fulfill the law, the requirements that God said. These are the things you have to do in order to receive the promise. Jesus did them. Where does Jesus live now? In me. So what does that mean? The requirements are met. Right? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Woo! Man. But we were taught, or at least I remember as kids, that we were taught that questioning God shows a lack of faith. And that questioning God could be a sin. But the only thing where it can get sinful is if you question His reality. If you question His reality and the truth of the cross and what happened on the cross, the new covenant, the new testament, right? What Jesus did for us. What the blood bought and paid for. If you question that, then you've stepped across into sin. Because there is no discussion of that. That was the one time, once and for all, forgiveness for all sin, the saving, Savior saving from all sickness, all disease, anything that would ever come, past, present, or future. There's nothing that will ever catch Jesus or the blood off guard. That sin is covered by the blood. That disease, whatever the name may be, is covered by the blood. It is cleansed by the blood. It is healed by the blood. It covers your destiny. That's why the song, man, I'm just telling you, if you would, it, it, I hope you pay attention to the words. Because when someone writes a song, it is, it is revelation. It's direct from the heart of God. And when a song is that direct and it shows that much uh, direction, right? It's rewriting your history. It rewrote it. But it's continually rewriting it. It's That's what's... Lord have mercy, that was a great place for an amen. It's rewriting your history, even currently. So even if you get a cancer diagnosis, that's not your future. Cancer's not your future. And I say, even if you die... From, the, from cancer, cancer is not your future, and cancer doesn't get the victory. Glory. I believe just the opposite. That not only is it okay, but we should question God. Why? Because just as any good teacher, right? If you're in a classroom, I know, I'm, and believe me, I <laughs> don't go there. I was not a good student. I did enough to get by. I knew, when, I knew when the teacher wanted me to ask a question, right, so it would look like I was engaged, right, and then I'd go back to doing whatever I want to do. But there are many people that I know that would ask questions. Why? Because they just thirsted for knowledge. They wanted to know. They want to know how computers work. They want to know how cars work. They want to know this. They want to know that. So Christians should want to know how God works. Christians should want to know how the Word works. The Word works for those that work the Word. Right? Hallelujah. Questioning, reasoning, seeking out knowledge all leads to the truth. God said He wouldn't withhold bread. Right? If you came and asked Him for a piece of bread, He's not going to let you leave with a bowl of soup. If you want a bowl of soup, ask for a bowl of soup. If you want bread, ask for bread. Right? Don't say, God, whatever your will. No. No, you got to be specific with God. What do you want to know? Ask Him what you want to know. I don't know when you'll get an answer, but you might as well ask Him because there's nobody else to ask, right? You can always ask your pastors. Your pastors have good information, but it's best to hear straight from the source, amen? When you get to the truth, it causes you to grow, and by growing, it grows your faith, right? That's why God encourages us to question. 
He wants your faith to expand. He wants your faith to grow. We say it all the time, faith is a muscle. You have to work the muscle in order for it to stay healthy. Mm. Glory. And there's tons of examples in the Bible of superstars. I'm talking like all the major players. Anybody you want to think has spent some form or fashion time questioning God about something, right? So, flip over to... Uh, let me get ahead. I'm going to get ahead of myself here. Well, let me read this. <sighs> we were discussing how individually we deal with our seasons of hardship, right? And some seasons are longer than others. Some require a little more stamina. And the other story that really struck me that we started discussing, so the first one was about the Israelites and their plight of wandering for 40 years. And then the other discussion came up of the guy that was born blind, the beggar. Remember they met him at the gate? And the disciples came to Jesus. Let's just flip over to that. It's in uh, John, let's see, John chapter 9, right? Isn't that where it's at? Pretty sure. Yep. Glory to God. <laughs> let me get to let me catch up in my notes here. Okay. So, in chapter 9, as Jesus was walking along verse 1, he saw a man who had been blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, "Why is this man? Why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sin?" As a baby, he would come into this world, we come in sinless as a child, right? Or was it because of the sins of his parents? Now, this was where we started talking about the real discussion of how Christians, we always say, why do good things happen to God's people, right? I mean, bad things happen to God's people. I remember when I had my very first uh, car accident, vehicle wreck. <laughs> this, is, this might sting, I don't know. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. It stung me and it stuck with me forever. They asked me, you must have sin, or they said, you must have some sin in your life in order to have the wreck, right? And I, as a kid, I'm just telling you, that's, that stuck with me forever. And I told them, I mean, even like when I went away to college, I've told you all the story before I would go out and go partying, which, I mean, that's what everybody does in college, right? You know, I would ask God, say, now if something happens to me tonight, man, I'm just asking you right now, forgive me, but I'm, I'm going out to party. I mean, going with all my friends, that's, that's what we do, right? But I was fearful of God, I was scared of God so much so that I didn't want to go out and do that without Him knowing that I was fixing to go do it, but that I still loved Him and that I wanted His forgiveness afterward, especially, you know, if something bad was to happen. Well, fast forward all these years later and we have a child, my oldest, who was a heroin addict. Started out simple, just stealing hydrocodones and oxycodones and all those things and turned into a full-blown heroin addiction. And thank God for places like Canaan Land Ministries where men can go Amen. to get clean. And he went through it two times. Well, a time and a half, but still, let's just consider it two times. And there's not a day that goes by that we don't have that, that thought in the back of our mind that you have to fight that fear and anxiety. But he's a grown man. Like, you know what I'm saying? He's a grown man, but I'm his dad. So I'm there with him. It's just, it's no different than me and Sissy. Like every day I'm, I pray for my mother-in-law. Every day I pray for my wife. Every day I pray for my child, my children. Because I know that this is a fight. It's a struggle. And so having said that, right, have, being fearful of God, knowing that my child could go out and die with a needle in his arm, knowing that he has already given his life to Christ, right, then that started this whole journey of understanding how much God loves us, right? And not turning your back on God, understanding that we're sinful people, right? We, we go out and we do stuff. We mess up. But God said that, that mess up is not going to destroy our relationship. The only thing that could ever destroy your relationship with God is literally turning your back on Him and saying, I don't believe in you. Just like I just said a minute ago. The only question to ask him that is going to separate you from him is whether he's real or not 
and whether the cross was real or not. Other than that, you can pretty much ask him anything. He wants you to come and, and, and fellowship with him and, and get this quest quenched for knowledge as to who he is and what you are capable of as a human being here on the earth. Because like I said, greater still is what Jesus said when he left. I don't know about you, but when I look around, I don't see greater still, right? I see good. I mean, everything's going good. Everything's going okay. Churches are half full. Christians are okay. Christians are sick. Christians are making decent money. They got a nice house. They got a nice car. They're doing good. But it's just, it's just copacetic, man. Everything's just hunky-dory. But back in the day, man, it was all about getting souls saved. It was about going out and doing these huge promotions. Now, I'm just, I mean, obviously, look at us. We're all getting older, right? We're getting older. So these young churches, these guys that have these 20 and 30 and 35 and even 40-year-olds that have all this energy, right? Those are the churches that are exploding because why? They want to get out there and see this world changed. I don't want to hand this world to my grandchildren. I watch my little girls crawling around on the floor and it's so innocent and so beautiful and I'm like man what's the world going to be like when they get up here and I see all the things that are going on overseas you know and and bad things are happening to good people Christians God's people in Israel are dying because of bombs do you want to literally look at that person and say, well, I'm sorry the bomb blew up in your building, but I mean, I guess you must have sinned today or something. No. So what that discussion uh, led to was the realization and the understanding that there's sin in the world. That's the way God set it up, right? We said the wages of sin are death. So, we, so you have to separate that. The wages of sin create a, a circle in the atmosphere that God set in motion to where he is not personally responsible to pour out vengeance on you because you sinned. It's the nature and the, and the cycle of the world. The sin is here, whether you participate in it or whether you don't, or how much you participate in it or how much you don't. All depends on you, right? But it's out there. And guess what? You're in this world, but you're not of it. So because you're in it, you're walking around in it, which means you are subject to the sins of the world. And it's, it's terrible. I, I, I think to myself, like, that's just not fair, but it's the world we live in. And so in our discussion, and I was telling Holly this the other day, I said, you know, the minute we're born, y'all heard, I, I didn't come up with this, so don't, don't think I came up with this. The minute we're born, we, we start our journey to death, Right? That's just the way it is. So the older that we get, the, the more that your body has been used and abused and all these things, it's, it's definitely good for you, it's healthy for you to take care of it and to do the things that God instructed us to do in order to take care of our body, in order to have a healthy body, right? And there's all kinds of things out here that man has created to help you do that. But there's a very simple way of doing it too. It's just ask God, what do you want me to eat? What do you want me to... What do you want me to live on, right? And you can do that, and God will give you a food plan and all this other stuff. God will literally guide you through life. So every decision that you make, every choice that you make, can lead to something down the line that's going to come back to you. So when you sit and you say to yourself, how did this happen to me, or whatever, there's really no reason to even question that. So let me read this other part of this article that I... All right, so when the, when the disciples were asking him why he was born blind, this article said Jesus is directly going to counter this, this mistake that the disciples made in verse 3. His, his response will be that personal suffering is not necessarily linked to one's own personal sin. In a broad sense, all suffering is a result of sin, the aftershocks of the fall of man through Adam and Eve. It's also true that most of the suffering we experience in this world is primarily the result of human sin. It's just the way it is, right? One man, one person, 
gets it in his mind that he wants to go kill everybody in a bank. Right? Well, the government wants to stop that by stopping weapons. That's not going to stop it. How can you stop someone who has that thought in their mind? you got to stop the mind first. Well, what's, what's going to stop the mind? Sharing the gospel, the good news. That's the only thing that can set a mind straight is Jesus. But God forbid you're in that bank on that day when somebody comes in there and starts shooting, right? And you say, well... You know, because we're born again and this, that shouldn't happen to us and this, that, and the other. But it does. It happens every single day. It happens every single day. God said, we are in this world, but we are not of it. So what do you do? Every day, I tell y'all, every day, I'm not kidding, I'm not joking, I'm not making this up. Every single day before we leave our house, we put our armor on. I don't get up every morning like pastor does and read five hours of the word or pray for five hours, but I every day put my armor on because it reminds me. It's a good reminder. Now, there's times during the day when I'm listening and and praying and praising and whatever, but I don't do it all day long. That doesn't disqualify me from his protection. But if something bad happens to me, I say, rest assured, I know where I'm going. That's what, it, that's what it's all about at the end of the day is knowing where you're going. This is just part of the fight right here. Hallelujah. Everything from political unrest to poverty and hunger are grounded in humanity rejecting their created purpose. But as this man's example shows, not all suffering is directly deserved, right? Everybody knows the term karma, right? Right? That's what they say. Well, you get what you deserve. No, not in this sense. Not everything that happens to a person happens because they did something wrong. Bad things happen to good people. Nobody can explain it. And I think that's one of the things that we've damaged ourselves doing is trying to explain why something happens when truly God is sovereign. We can't explain why. And we say, and we say like when a good soul goes home or when a godly person goes home, well, they must have needed them in heaven. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, it seems to me God's got plenty of angels. You know? But the fact of the matter is, is that life brought glory to God. That's the bottom line. Hardship and suffering, including persecution, are not surefire signs of divine retribution. This directly counters the Eastern idea of karma, which suggests that all suffering is in some way that person's fault. So the question still remains, and this is my thoughts. Why do we endure hardships? If the Bible says, this is my words now, this is me dictating to Siri as I'm driving down the road. I did have to go through and clean up a lot of uh, uh, stuff that she didn't understand. If the Bible says we are healed by his stripes, why does it not go on to say for all to see while we're walking the earth? Right? It says we're all healed. So we have to partake of that, right? So the ones that get it, we, there's no explanation. I can't tell you why one person gets it and one person doesn't. There's no way I can explain that. But God can answer this question for me. So that's what I said. So it's why does it not say, why does it not go on to say that while we're all here walking the earth to bring you glory and to solidify your power, And your reign. Suffice it to say that we may never know. And truly that's what God wants. He wants us to trust him no matter what. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. He is God. Trust that and that only. Beyond that is when the questions can become sinful. When questions lead to separation. When questions bring you comfort and get you close to God. They're building your faith. Now, I had to look inward to myself and say, I've always been the type of person who I just trust God. It gets on Holly's nerves so bad. And and, and even, you know, going back as a kid and questioning them as a a teenager and stuff growing up, why, you know, why this and why that? And they would give me scripture and verse, and I'd say, I don't want scripture and verse. I want your, like, your advice, your opinion as a mom and a dad, a person who grew up, You know, flesh and bone, whatever, not spiritual. I don't want spiritual. But they would always give me spiritual advice because once they figured it out, 
that they had been doing it wrong for so long, they said, this is the only right way to do it. And so from that point forward, I just trusted God. I'm like a kid. I just trust God. But then I started thinking, you know, I'm also, I don't like confrontation. I, I don't like to fight. And God knows that about me. So, you know, Holly will tell you, well, that's not true because you always fight with me. Well, she's, she's, your, she's the spouse, right? I mean, if you're not going to fight with your spouse, who are you going to fight with? But, but that's the truth. I'm not confrontational. So I'm just like, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's within me that I don't want to fight. I just want to trust. And there's nothing wrong with that. So if you get to the point where you trust and you just stand, having done all to stand, stand. You can only stand in faith. You can't stand in fear. Well, you can, I guess. Technically, you could, but it's, that's not a very firm stance. Stand in faith, and having done all to stand, stand. Just believing God, praying always, praying. <laughs> just pray. If you don't know what else to do, and you don't know what else to say, just pray. <laughs> Praise God. Man. We are all opportunities for God's power to be seen. God's power isn't glorified by us getting what we want. Now, that statement, uh, when he said that to me, I was like, well, that's, uh, that's true. Because if I was to ask for a show of hands, everybody in here would want their loved one or themselves or whatever healed because that's what we want. We want. And we think that that's what's going to bring God the most glory. But when Jesus said about the young man, he said, let me read it to you again. When the disciples asked why this man was born blind, how could he be sinful as a baby? His parents' sins, Jesus' answer said, neither. It wasn't because of his sin or his parents' sin. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Right? So you can take that 20 different ways. That means, you know, well, that man had struggled his whole life with whether God was real and when Jesus walked in and healed him, that that solidified everything that day. He knew God was real and that he not only brought glory in himself to recognize and give reality and proof to God, but then he went off and testified to everybody as to he had been healed, right? So he continued to bring more glory to God. But what if he hadn't have received it? He still would have met Jesus. Jesus was real. He was walking the earth. And so you have to say to yourself, okay, well, what if I don't get it? Is that going to change the fact that God still sits on the throne? Is it going to change my outlook? Is it going to change my fight? I'm just going to stand firm and trust. I'm just going to stand still and believe. I'm going to stand in faith, immovable, because that's what he wants me to do. And at the end of the day, really and truly, all he cares about is your trust. That's all he cares about. That's all he cares about. I mean, we make it about doing all sorts of things to get him to move and, and do that. And there's some reality to all that, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong. We used to say all the time, uh, time name your seed, right? If you're believing for God for something, name your seed. Don't let your wallet control you. Because your, your finances can create fear in you that creates distrust in you about anything else that God would do for you. Well, I gave so-and-so this time, and I didn't see that hundredfold return. Well, my little song there, Miracles on Miracles, why don't you go back and look for the little miracles? Was there a bunch of little miracles there that took the place of one big hundredfold? I would venture to say yes. There's all kinds of things that should have happened or could have happened that didn't happen because you were obedient. That's what it's all about, being obedient. Praise God. So Jesus said it was so the power could be seen in him. So God's power isn't glorified just by us getting what we want. God's power is glorified when we trust in him. Plain and simple. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I hope that ministered to y'all as much as it ministered to me. Because like I said, I'm, I've been... I've been there's so much more to that that I, that I could have done. That was just in the simplest form. But I just want everybody to know, along your fight, the struggle that you're facing, just move over into trust. 
I don't know where you're at right now in your fight. I don't know how much pain you're feeling. But the reality is, Jesus said it. I didn't. It's in the Bible. That he bore your sin, sickness, and disease. He bore that pain on the cross. And it's just for us to stand in and receive. So today, just take that position of receiving. Just raise your hands to heaven. I say it all the time. I've been believing God for miracles, and I want miracles to happen. Testifiable, testimoniable, writable, downable, all kinds of miracles that we can see, hear, feel, and watch. I believe and I trust. I appreciate all the examples that have been put out there for us to see. And I take authority over doubt and unbelief and I take authority over fear. In Jesus' name, I cast down depression. I cast down oppression. And I thank you for peace. Peace. Just peace. Hallelujah. Just listen to that. Just feel that. You know, you spend all day running, especially this time of year for the holidays. Running, fighting, struggling, chaotic. Just to come in here and and in His peace. Let Him perfect you. Let Him heal you. Let Him quiet your mind. And all those thoughts that we fight. Let Him heal your body. Every cell. Every every blood vessel. Every muscle. Every tissue. Every fiber. Every organ. In Jesus name. From the top of our head to the soles of our feet. I heard this the other day and it made me chuckle. From the toenails to the crown. Hallelujah. 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 Father, there's nothing you can't do. There's nothing you can't do. Thank you, Father. The one requirement for all of this is to be born again. If you're not born again today, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I feel pretty confident that everybody in the building is, but if you're watching today and you've never accepted Jesus, there's a like button on there. You can, you can uh, comment as you're watching. You can comment on the website, rolc.org, and just let us know. But if you're not born again today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, just raise your hand. Or if you're backslidden and you're away from Him, separated, like I said, you don't trust Him. You've lost trust in Him. You've lost faith in Him due to circumstances or whatever's happened in your life. There's some pretty legit things going on out there that that can easily cause a setback. Believe me. (laughs) Believe me. So it's not unheard of, and don't think you're alone. For crying out loud, I I see that all the time. Like, people don't come to church because they think people are going to judge them. Shame on you if you do. Because he with no sin, please cast the first stone. (laughs) And if you're going to do that, you might as well start throwing at me because I'm not perfect. So, Heavenly Father, just repeat after me, everybody. Say, Heavenly Father, I receive you. I trust you. I believe in you. I believe that you died for me, went to hell for me. On the third day, you rose for me, and you're seated at the right hand of God in a position of power just for me, that you're an intercessor for me. You've got my back at every turn. I call you my Lord, my Savior, and my King. In Jesus' name, I'm healed, I'm set free, and I'm delivered. Hallelujah. I believe that. I receive that in Jesus' name. 
And I thank you, Lord, that I've got the power and the evidence of speaking with other tongues. That power from on high that the devil can't understand and that we don't understand all of it, Father, but we know that we've got it and the power and peace that comes with it in Jesus' name. Now, angels, I send you forth today to all the highways, the byways, the hospital rooms, the bedrooms where all the sick and dying are, are sitting, crying out for you, and I thank you that your power is on them right now. There's no distance or time in the Spirit, and I thank you, Lord, that by the Spirit, we are laying hands on all those, whatever their ailment may be, in Jesus' name, I thank you for testimonies of healing today, in Jesus' name. Cancer's uprooted in Jesus' name. Diabetes and blood work come back normal in Jesus' name. Vision restored. Hearing restored. Headaches gone in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Arthritis, I curse you in Jesus' name and I cast you away. And I thank you, Lord, for healing, healing, healing in Jesus' name. Amen. I know everybody's been there. I know everybody's been where he's talking today. And I just want to thank my God that his grace is sufficient. When we trust. When we trust. Because that's really what, it, that's what grace is. Grace is knowing in your heart and trusting in your heart that the good work that he started, he will finish. That's why when I look at him, that's what I say every time. The good work that my daddy started in him, he will finish it. He's the author, and he's the finisher of our faith. So we just stand, and having done all to stand, we stand. One way or the other, we win. The only way we can lose is if we quit. Truth? You know, we were talking about cancer. You go to heaven, are you healed? Yeah, you sure are. More healed than you've ever been in your whole life. You got a whole brand new body that'll never get sick, never get sad, never have a bad day. No, near, no. There's no darkness. And God can't put anything bad on us anyway. You know that? He doesn't have bad. If he doesn't have bad, he can't give you bad. But we know who, who does give the bad. He doles it out. So I'm just telling you, great thank you for sharing that, Sean. Because all of us deal with those things. But the bottom line is, I trust God. Amen? Now, Father, I want to thank you that you protected our van this morning and all of, our, all of, its, all of its occupants this morning on the way here. And I just want to thank you that you will protect them on the way home as well as everybody else. Angels, we send you forth, surround each and every one to protect and to keep them in Jesus' name until we meet again tonight at 530. Amen? Glory to God. All right, don't forget our Christmas Eve services are at 10 a.m. And our candlelight is at 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve. That's next Sunday, believe it or not. Uh, New Year's Eve, um, which is also on a Sunday, uh, services will be at 10 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. as normal. And I'm excited about, I want to hear what everybody's hearing from the Lord. Don't you? About 2024? I, if you didn't hear Wednesday night, yes, amen. We pray for the election. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's right. We thank God for that. Amen. 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 All right. Um, also, we still need help with Panera. If you can help with Panera on Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock where you pick up Panera in Fort O and deliver it to the uh, community kitchen the next day, you can see Teresa. Even if you can just do it one day a week, that'd be awesome. And don't forget about EGOM. Oh, we on the finals of the house. We on the finals, 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 finals on the house. It, the house is done. 
Now we need to supply the inside and pay off what they uh, what this last you got part has you cost. got twenty eight couples all over America doing it right now. What do you mean? Oh yeah, yeah. So anyway, we're just excited. I, it is so needed. I, you know, I minister in to the women in jail all the time, and they are crying out for a place to go. Crying out for a place to go, and I know that Lynn will show them the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? And get them delivered. Yeah, devil doesn't have a chance. <laughs> so, E-G-O-M. And until then, I'll see you tonight. Angels go with you. I love you, love you, love you. <laughs>